All right, let's uh, welcome our panel panelists to come to the front and uh, we'll start our panel starters. Awesome. Well, one more. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> All right, welcome everyone and uh, welcome our uh, panelists. Before our panel discussion start, I will briefly, you know, introduce our uh, panelists again. And uh, we have uh, Professor Sergey Levin from uh, UC Berkeley, okay. and we have Professor David Ramnan from uh, CMU, and we have Alex Kendall from uh, WIF, who is a CEO of WIF, and we have Yuning Chai from uh, uh, Cruz. Yeah. All right. So now we will start our panel discussions. The formal panel discussion will be will prepare a few questions to ask our panelists and then we can also have our audience to ask a few questions that which you believe that is important for you know self-driving uh, vehicle research all right so now let's start the first question is related with our topic the major topic today end-to-end -to -end autonomous driving so as we may know that most of the product system now still is based on modular autonomy pipeline. So my ask, you know, what's your opinion about how far are we from fully deploying end-to-end -end models in real world driving product? Uh, could we entirely get rid of modular pipelines in future? Yeah, who wants to take that? Okay. Hey, so I think uh, what, what I showed in my talk and what we've been able to show at Wave with end-to-end -end learning is um, I, I think it's really stretching the boundaries of what's possible in autonomy. Um, but just to ground ourselves in where we're at today, I call us GPT 0.5. We are, um, you know, we are just at the beginning of this journey. I expect everything we're seeing, there are, are, are parallel results in end-to-end -end learning for driving that, that you tend to see when we've scaled up. Uh, machine learning applications for other areas you know like let me reference the gpt example again and i i expect we'll see similar results as we scale up the size and and um, capacity as well as the data i can't think of a reason why there would be a glass ceiling for this approach i certainly wouldn't be betting against machine learning problems today and if there's anything i think the last couple of years should be teaching us is that um, these methods are, are you know by far the most powerful at solving really complex um, high dimensional problems. If you have those foundations of data, um, a fast feedback, uh, an effective feedback signal and sufficient compute, I think we're getting close. Um, would anyone like to follow? Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I still feel like the, the, I think I guess I am biased for being a, a vision person where I think most of the challenges from my experience somehow are perception related. So from that perspective, it's it seems natural to me to kind of focus on that with with more um, sort of aggressiveness. But it's true that this I kind of believe there's a trend of even in the perception stack, it tended to be like highly modular with little pieces. First you would detect and then you would track and then you would forecast. And it seems like maybe there's ways to even make that more end to end. Um, so I guess it was this direction that uh, it seems like um, the integrated um, makes a lot of sense, but 
from at least from my time in, in sort of actually in the industry, it seems super important to have not just the solution, but like a point there. So my guess is it's going to be like gradually becoming more end to end ish, if that makes sense. Um, Go for it. I think I, I might be the least qualified on this panel to answer this when it comes to actually deploying things since I'm, uh, you know, not in the business of deploying autonomous driving systems. Um, my sense is that for um, navigation that is not driving, like, for example, sidewalk robots, that sort of thing, like the, the kind of the stuff I showed in my talk, I think that's very, very close. But I think that the driving stuff, my somewhat uninformed opinion is that it, it might be tough, not so much just for technological reasons, but also partly for like kind of pipeline engineering culture reasons in the sense that like, you know, any, any autonomous driving system requires a lot of work, a lot of engineering, regardless of how it works. And there are good engineering pipelines and good engineering teams around kind of the more modular method. And uh, it may be that the intense stuff, well, maybe in the long run, it's easier and better and uh, has a lot of benefits, but it doesn't dispense with the need to have solid engineering and all that stuff. So if I had to guess, and my somewhat uneducated guess on this would be that uh, it may actually be that the bearer is like developing all the right kind of engineering discipline uh, kind of stuff around the very different way that, that we have to work with end-to-end -end things. Um, but that's just a guess. Okay. All right. Um, so, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, as I, I uh, had a slide uh, talk about this before, um, yeah, I wouldn't bet against uh, um, like end-to-end -end system either. I think there's certainly, even when we look at today's stack, even for the major players, right? I mean, again, right, this is no, no big secret, as you said yourself, right? This is a lot of players still use a more modular stack. But I think when you look at um, there, even now, there are situations, I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't share more, but there are situations where an end-to-end -end stack is certainly more appropriate. And I think this is something that, and, and I think with time, it's possible um, that for a lot of situations, an end-to-end -end stack is perfectly fine. Although having said that, I'm still worried for, you know, like if you work in this domain, if you see all the long tails I talked before, and as we know, machine learning models are really not good at long tail situation. They're really good at modeling the general. Another question is related with today's hot topic that is called a word model. This is it's very surprising, not surprising, but it's really it's really fantastic to see quite a few talks that cover the word model. And uh, we are trying to perceive our word and understand its dynamic behaviors within it. My question is related with, based on different talks, we see different form or different representations of our word. There are some of the word model leading towards more explicit, interpretable representations. Some are entirely neural network, which is implicit. My question is whether explicit representations is necessary because whenever we have an objective function, we, we basically distort our focus towards, you know, distract our focus from, you know, active data, right? So uh, I'm wondering whether you're, you have some insights towards that. Steve, you can start. Oh, yeah, you, you start. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, what, uh, one of the questions I grappled with for many years was, um, if you're building a scene representation, should you use a global representation, an implicit representation, or should you have a representation of a on a per object basis? You, know, you could think of a, a vector representing the whole scene or a vector per object. Um, and you know, if you are able to discretize the world into objects, you know, it can be much more efficient to explicitly represent those. Um, I, I think when you start to, to again get to the long tail and self-driving, uh, 
one of the challenges actually in discretizing out objects, the thing that's been really interesting for me to watch, if you look at the um, more modular based uh, uh, self-driving stacks, particularly the vision only stacks, you know, we saw some presentations today on, on, on those approaches. Uh, there's been this transition over the last few years from, you know, the battleground a couple of years ago was really who could build the most robust cuboid detector for around objects and uh, lane line detectors. And then once you have those two, then you can put a planner in place. The work we've seen presented today from some of the talks was who can build the best um, voxel occupancy detector. And uh, the reason being that voxel occupancy is more flexible than cuboids. If you're opening a car door or if you have an articulating truck or something like this, then you can represent them. And so there's been this push to more and more flexible object representations. And if you move to say, you know, a vectorized representation, then that can learn whatever you want. I think that's great. But ultimately there's going to continue to be edge cases. And so while I think for practical reasons, perhaps a hybrid method, or, you know, if you look at our world model, K01 that we presented today, a lot of the scenes are, when you explore them, you know, they are, are very consistent. The static world, you know, doesn't change. And so um, representing the static and dynamic world and focusing more signal, you know, in a foveated way on the things that move that are really more interesting to model, you know, might come with, with benefits. But at the limits of compute and data, I would argue that if you take away those engineering um, hurdles and, and as the scales, I, I do think an implicit end-to-end -end representation will, will win out. Um, it just might, a hybrid uh, solution might be a shortcut to get there. Um, yeah, I, I think my answer to this would be somewhat somewhat similar to Alex's actually, that um, basically representations for, for prediction are really, really important. Like we, we know uh, from psychological studies on humans that people's representations are dynamic. They change with the tasks they're trying to do. They focus on things, ignore other things. And it seems kind of strange that if we, if we want to do, uh, if we want to use learning to, uh, let's say like acquire a perception system, you know, that, that, because it's difficult to do it any other way. Well, if acquiring the right representation for things like prediction is such a, such a complex and tricky problem and such an important one, shouldn't we be using learning for that as well? Shouldn't we be figuring that out from data? And I, I think there are many different ways that that could be approached, right? So we could imagine just like directly predicting raw pixels. Uh, even then there's choices to be made that affect representations. You could, for example, um, you would get one representation if you try to predict outcomes of different actions, you would get a different representation if you try to predict the outcomes of different closed loop strategies. Uh, a, a very simple example is um, if I gave you a sequence of motor commands like, uh, you know, literally like like nerve activations that I my body was going to execute for the next two hours and ask you where I'll end up uh, in the world, that would be a very difficult prediction problem. But if I tell you that I, I'm trying to uh, go to the uh, you know, coffee shop at the corner of that street and that street, and I ask you, where will I be an hour from now? Well, you probably have a pretty good guess, right? So, uh, and, and and that's just on the, the strategy layer. Then there's the question of what you predict, whether it's pixels, whether it's uh, locations, whether it's something more implicit, like the information that is necessary to take some future action. Uh, and all this, these things will affect representations. And I think there's a lot to explore there. I think we can likely acquire much better representations that way implicitly than what we could design ourselves. Got it. Maybe I'll, I'll throw in one more um, kind of, uh, I guess, color to the discussion, which is it, it does seem like um, maybe one bet that I'd be willing to make is that it, I would suspect the representations have to have um, sort of some some spatial structure and, and have it be some form of 3D or 4D. Um, and maybe I would state that because uh, it seems like it's, well, the the world is does have spatial structure. The world does have temporal evolution in time, and so um, uh, the, one of the questions I wrestle with is that you know do humans have sort of metric spatial representations? And there's a lot of evidence evidence suggests that that's not really the case. And so maybe maybe there's a way of doing this without going all the way to this explicit uh, you know metric reconstruction of what's going on. But it feels like right now, to me, that's such an attractive way to pursue because. You know, while we while we have this you know revolution in data driven self supervised learning, which I think you know nat very naturally applies to temporal sen sensor streams, we also have this revolution in three D modeling, um, and so uh, it feels like it's so natural to try to integrate those things in because the current stacks we know are all you know very fundamentally have four D explicit uh, explicitly encoded. So it seems like that's such an attractive way to try to go forward. So, yeah. Just ask a question. Do you do you think there's a 
need for um, metric space reasoning because in navigation, for example, a lot of it is simply topological. Like in driving, you don't care about is that car 5.38 meters away? It's is it there? And um, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. So I sort of wrestle with this as well. Like another example, I always kind of try to like self intuit is all right. So how does a uh, how does a dog navigate? And I, I don't think it's doing metric scale reconstruction, but at that level, it seems like it's much more about um, sort of motion and flow and time to contact. And so it could be that those are representations that are more natural rather than metric scale. So, so that's why I sort of, I, I leave the possibility open that uh, if you do something truly data-driven and learned, it could be those things emerge. Uh, I guess it's more of a, of like a practical bet that I would make now, just given the, the tools that we have available. Um, yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I guess it's hard to read anymore. Uh, maybe one thing there is, we see multiple objects of information, like if someone is doing the first time, well, then we have to take the uh, we, we, we don't have a way to prove that, to learn, to learn the behavior. We're not going to drive out of the drive out of the But if we can inject some information, maybe I'll give an example of the paper safe net from the So, you know, things that are along those lines. Uh, probably the interaction with the uh, network representation and the injected information it needs to somehow happen at some level. Uh, maybe from that perspective, uh, still, those are the explicit representation of right? all, all people we need to find the other way, like maybe injecting the explicit information in a left way so they interact in a more things. So, what are your thoughts now? Um, I, I think something that I think multiple speakers here have said before is something to the effect of like in the short term, explicit representations seem more approachable than in the long term. So, I think definitely in the short term, I would agree with you, but I think that longer term, it's it's not at all clear to me for the following reason that I think. Like clearly safety is very important and it's a major challenge for learn models. But at the same time, it seems like many of the trickiest cases in safety have less to do with imposing well understood constraints and more to do with grounding constraints in messy edge case situations. So you could say like, well, you have a constraint like, um, you know, the car should not geometrically intersect a pedestrian, like a pretty obvious constraint, right? The trouble is that you might be in a situation where understanding what is a pedestrian or whether you're about to uh, hit them is itself the difficult part. So it's grounding the rules, not, not describing the rules. And if if we need the most powerful and most generalizable model we can get to ground those rules, it seems pretty likely to me that in the long run, such a model would actually kind of be powerful enough that um, we wouldn't need the explicit part anyway. I'm not sure of that. I think this is kind of a guess, but that's why it's not at all clear to me. Exactly, because I think that the, the, the toughest cases for safety are exactly those that nothing else can solve anyway, so we need the most performant thing possible to address those, and if that's going to be a learning thing, well, then it's got to be implicit. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, first, I totally agree with uh, you know, the, the rest of the panelists here. Um, just so one thing I wanted to add is that the word model we are building for self-driving needs to be application-driven. Depend, it's, it varies a lot whether we are building this for model test for validation of our stack versus if we were to do it for training. For example, for validation, you need the interpretability. Maybe something explicit is more suitable, right? Or if, if you don't, then, well, the only chance you have is to train a model to interpret your word model. And then, uh, you know, we know that these model can hallucinate and all this stuff, and this might be difficult to deal with as well. But if we were to do it for training, we might just want to optimize for uh, you know, the gain in the model itself. Say we have another way to evaluate the system. So ultimately, I think uh, we just need to be really you know, be, be careful you know, what, we are, what we are aiming for, whether training or evaluation, whether we are trying to improve the end-to-end -end system, whether we want to train offline reinforcement models. So you know, depending on the application, we'll need different things. Great, very insightful discussions, and it's great to see we have different opinions. And uh, the next question is also very exciting because that really brings new opportunities to the domain of self-driving. That thing is called foundation models. In today's you know, talks, we have seen very different form of usage of foundation models, starting from generating AI 
to large language model to help driving two foundation models for multi-modality world modeling and so on. So I think this is actually a one hour opportunity for our uh, panelists to share their research philosophy about you know, what they believe about you know, foundation models for self-driving, what is the killer you know, usage or killer applications for us to be able to push foundation models in self-driving vehicles. And that will be also share some you know, insights to our grad student to, to come up with the next wave of ideas. Yeah. So I'll start uh, first this time. Um, so yeah, I, I talked a little bit about foundation models uh, earlier. And I think I, I still struggle a little bit. Uh, I think there's there are certainly foundation models that we can use uh, as it is today, right? We talk about Clip, we talk about Sam and so on. Um, I think I struggle, personally struggle a little bit more with how to deploy them directly uh, to self-driving car. I think maybe Alex has a different view. Um, we also try to ask ChatGPT how to like navigate certain situations. We, I remember we had a construction scenario. We asked GP, ChatGPT, what should we do next? ChatGPT said, said uh, wait for the construction to finish. <laughs> Not, yeah, well, it does solve the problem to some extent, but then it's very difficult to kind of, you know, constrain. I know, I know there are a lot of work on kind of query uh, engineering and so on, but it's still very difficult to kind of constrain and, and to, to have it produce something that the planner can then understand. For me, the most exciting thing about foundation model is really the journey. When I look at the GPT literature, the journey that they took from GPT-1 all the way to GPT-4. And I think this is fascinating to me. They started with a very simple model, right? When you read the GPT-1 uh, paper, start with that. They, had, they, they identified, the, they had a work on scaling law, right? identifying that, and then to predict like, how much will we gain if we were to further scale our models, right? This step-by-step -step evolution is where what really inspires me personally. And this is hopefully uh, something that we can, we can uh, it's kind of kind of almost like we can obey to this uh, evolution as well. Uh, Sergey, how did you define a foundation model in your talk? I think you called it a really big or a really awesome model. Very good model. So under, under that definition, I think there's a really important use for foundation models in self-driving. Just make them better and bigger. How do we wrestle with that? And so that, that's one place where, so I guess current text-based foundation models are trained on trillions of words. Um, I don't think we're there yet for images. Um, I think people are trying, it's just difficult to pull off. Um, so then the, the sense of, you know, can we actually do that in terms of uh, sort of driving streaming sensor footage, I think it's still an open question. Um, uh, so, so, so there's that aspect, and I think that's also one of the the really big difficulties with uh, end to end as well. Because then, if you really have to validate that um, at that scale, that seems that seems like a big challenge. Um, so, one 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 approach that we've been sort of thinking about is maybe that the right way to deal with it, the sort of safety issue is it's almost more of a a data characterization approach like uh sometimes it's even formed uh described in terms of an odd an operational design domain so this thing has been trained on these kinds of weather conditions and these geographic locations and so we'll issue a certificate that it, it, it can it, it can work in these in these conditions but then what's interesting about that is i think that certificate is somehow human interpretable maybe even with language it's, it's a characterization of where uh uh of where this thing can be trusted so I, I think that could be an interesting place where uh, these kind of multimodal models that have both you know sensor representations as well as language ones that are interpretable. Um, so that might be useful for, for even like making a safety case. Um, um, I, I think the other panelists have said a lot of things that I was going to mention too, but uh, I think I want to zoom in on the language model stuff because that's maybe like one of the fuzziest and perhaps most tantalizing, but also most unclear 
places where foundation models can make an impact on autonomous driving. Um, and I, I wanted to say something about robotics in general. I mean, autonomous driving is, of course, a, a robotics problem, but I think this is a general statement about the interplay of robotics and foundation models that maybe um, to kind of... Uh, uh, torture a JFK quote is it, maybe we shouldn't ask what foundation models can do for robotics, but ask what robotics can do for foundation models in the sense that the, the places where these language models really seem to struggle are exactly the, these like very rounded, very physical things, counterfactuals, uh, longer horizon planning type problems. These are all the problems that we encounter when we start working on robotics challenges. And perhaps what we should really be thinking about is how to develop better um, reasoning and sequence models that are everything that language models are and more by incorporating embodied experience, which should really be possible. You know, in some sense, if you imagine how a person solves the problem, you know, maybe at some level you solve the problem uh, with your notion of intuitive physics by thinking about, you know, how things look, how they move, or maybe you think about it in terms of semantics, you know, uh, and you kind of go up and down those levels dynamically. Uh, so if you want to, you know, build a tower out of blocks, maybe at some level you see it as a grounded physical problem with divorce from any semantics, but then maybe you remember that like, hey, uh, you know, maybe the, 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 the uh, uh, metal parts are slippery and you know that that's a semantic fact, whereas the wooden parts are less slippery. So maybe you'll use the wooden parts because they're less slippery and they'll stay together better. So we use all of those layers and perhaps robotics problems give us an opportunity to study these kinds of very deeply multimodal foundation models. And I think driving is a particularly appealing setting in which to think about that because it's one of the settings where there is ample data. Uh, you know, certainly like folks here might say, oh, hey, we don't have enough data, but you guys have way more data than any other robotics field. And certainly in terms of the number of cars that are on the road, like, hey, if using lots of data was a thing to make multimodal foundation models work, probably the driving domain is much closer uh, to enabling that research than anything else. I think the trillion data point question is an interesting one. I guess my question would be, what percentage of that, those trillion data points is going to be driving video data? Um, I think that if you then consider internet scale language and imagery can be part of that, if you consider simulation and synthetic data, I think that trillion data point number becomes a lot more, a lot more realistic and feasible. I expect that's the way we'll go. Right, speaking of data, so I do want to ask another question regarding simulation. So simulation seems to be perceived to be important in self-driving vehicles. Uh, I, I just want to ask, you know, the panelist opinion about, you know, how simulation could be playing uh, in critical roles in the self-driving stack, whether it's more like providing tons of, you know, training data or actually using simulation to validate some of the cases that we might not be able to validate in the real world, which one is more important and whether, you know, we should push Forwards more, you know, leveraging real data to build a better simulator. Yeah. Well, I guess that's a million dollar question here. Um, so, so I, I, yeah, I mean, you phrase it um, as if uh, we, we are not using simulation. I think a lot of players these days, we are already using simulation too. I mean, for behavior evaluation, we listened to Motional earlier. You need simulation to to be able to evaluate. Otherwise, you just other agents are just either on rails or you have an open loop uh, uh, evaluation that's just unreliable. Um, so it's already playing a, a critical role. Uh, the, the question is not when. The question is how much can we extend it, right? I think there's a question on uh, do we really need um, simulation to, uh, for example, to to generalize to to uh, long tail like really find long tail cases. That's basically what I talked about earlier. And I think definitely, yes. There's also the question on, okay, do we need closed loop simulation in the, in the vision environment, in the LIDAR environment, or can we still split the two as we do with some of the stacks? Um, but yeah, I think that's, um, that's things that we'll definitely need to figure out. I think as for training and evaluation, I do think validation, we always start with validation. If you can't validate something, you can't train against it. So validation is certainly important, but training is also important. The only thing to uh, to remind uh, to remember is that we should not use it for both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Then we are just you know fooling ourselves. I think building simulation and autonomous driving is the great chicken and egg problem. If you have a perfect simulator, I think you've you've solved the problem. I mean, you can think of if you have a perfect world model or a perfect simulator, then essentially you can you can 
look at the problem like a a tree search problem and if you look at what alpha go achieved you know with what, what the game of go has um uh was a 10 to the power of 160 states uh, it's extraordinarily complex and when you can perfectly model the and simulate or create a game environment then that problem is solved and i think if we had a perfect world model or perfect simulator then self-driving could go the same way um and so building a simulator is a little bit like building the ship as you're flying it uh, for self-driving and i think uh you know what i've seen in the last couple of years working on this is it's a real arms race uh, between the simulator and and the ai as the ai gets as the simulator gets better it allows the ai to improve and then uh, all of a sudden it hits limitations in the simulation platform and i think that's a effect that um, an adversarial effect that can be really helpful if you get it in the right in the right cadence um, but the other interesting thing we've seen is this uh shift from different modes of simulation over time you know we have a portfolio of simulation approaches that way from a procedurally generated um uh, virtual world to world modeling to nerfs to log replay to other synthetic data forms and it's been interesting to see how each has their pros and cons with where they excel where they uh, fall down in a centurial gap or something like that um and the other but importantly they complement each other and so it's been interesting to see how uh their successes have played out as uh, you know as we've grown the intelligence of our driving AI. Um, uh, I guess uh, maybe one thing I'll add is that it it seems like the 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 promise of simulation still has yet to be uh, um, yet to be fulfilled, and so the question is, what is the way to get there? And from my experience, again, one of the crucial things is that it's it's really important to have like a like a smooth incremental flight path, and so one of the places that I would think simulation can, can first kind of um, rear a benefit is is almost maybe through the lens of of data augmentation. You can think about we we already do that. We take existing data and we manipulate it, um, and it seems like we should be able to manipulate it in sort of three D viewpoints and uh, uh, maybe even move if 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 we do have sort of optic centric representations, move actors around. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so I, I guess that, th that would be, I guess that would be my bet on, on the way that it's going to materialize. So, uh, again, I think as, as the person on this panel who has the least experience actually deploying things or making things work, I think my answer will probably be the most idealistic, but, um, I think in the short term simulation serves a, a really important role. And certainly like, it's very difficult for me to imagine um, a development process for any robotics technolo technology, including uh, autonomous driving, that doesn't heavily make use of uh, simulation for validations, testing as part of the development process. But at the same time, I myself, in terms of the research, I'm very optimistic about methods that use real data. Not so much because I think that, that something about simulation is bad, but because I think real data is so good uh, in the sense that um, if you have robotic systems, uh, including cars, that are actually deployed in the real world at scale, like think about how many cars there are on the road if all of them are collecting data, it really seems like you should be getting everything you need from that experience to build a uh, working system. Now, it may be that you still will be actively using simulation as part of the process of developing that system or even the process of bootstrapping it to get it past that initial activation energy so it actually works well enough in the real world to be deployed at scale. But once it's there, it seems like you ought to be able to make use of the of the data that's coming in and do a lot better. Uh, one way to think about this is if you have a particular system where parts of that system improve as you get more and more experience, then eventually any part of the system that does not improve with experience becomes the bottleneck to performance, which means that if you're strongly relying on a hand-designed component for something to work, eventually that hand-designed component is the weakest link. Now, this is um, a much more um, kind of further out there kind of comment. And I definitely recognize that in the short term, I think it's really essential to have the right tools to allow us to iterate rapidly and also to iterate safely. But I think in the long run, I'm very optimistic about methods that uh, largely make use of real world data for this reason. I guess maybe I'll just add one one color to that. It seems like we could use some, uh, the term simulator in, in, in very different ways. There's kind of like the uh, like manually designed kind of Carla simulator, and then there's the sort of data driven, you could think of a world model as a simulator. So in that sense, I think, um, I don't know, maybe you you could you could still have it be sort of faithful to the data or at least try to uh, great one last question from the organizer so that is on behalf of our grad students so from grad student perspective you know uh 
we have limited resources in terms of data, in terms of access to closed loop environment, in terms of access to vehicle platform, maybe one or two in maximum per each university. You know, with those resource, uh, with those resources limitations, do we have any suggestions about how, as a grad student, we can contribute to the community? <laughs> A good question. Um, I, I think maybe like one bit that comes to mind that I, I might mention here is I think it's um, very tempting looking at the kind of um, results, especially those that are very publicly visible, um, to think that um, kind of all there is to do in, um, especially for robotics, autonomous driving, computer vision, is to basically uh, implement, scale up, and operationalize the kinds of ideas that already work. And I think there's actually a lot of value in doing in doing that kind of stuff. And I think that is something that even students could do with the limited resources available at a university. But at the same time, I think it's important to remember that there are also a lot of uh, very difficult and unsolved uh, kind of uh, more conceptual algorithmic problems. For example, a lot of the challenges we encounter in robotics, especially in autonomous driving, have to do, for example, with things like counterfactual inference, figuring out, given the data that you've seen, what will be the outcome of a completely different or new uh, intervention, or a new action. Uh, problems that have to do with uh, dealing with compounding errors in prediction and imitation learning. There are a lot of deep algorithmic questions that are actually unsolved and I think that it's actually kind of an unknown the degree to which current efforts to scale up and operationalize existing ideas are simply trying to uh, brute force challenges that are better off being solved in more nuanced ways. So I think it, you know it, it, it's important not to get distracted by the kind of results that end up showing up in the media and think that all there is left to do is you know scale up big transformers. There's a lot more to to, to than that. Of course, if you do just want to scale up big transformers, you know more power to you. That's uh, that has value too. Um. So I guess the, the the flavor of the question was how how should students kind of view getting into this game when they might not have access to um, you know crazy infrastructure? I guess that's that's certainly true in, in general of like many AI questions. You know, I don't know if it's if it, if it's reasonable for a student to get into training a foundation model that tries to compete with uh, with open AI. Um, one thing that that seems kind of healthy from the the AV community, which I wouldn't have expected coming going into this. So there seems to be this sort of healthy sort of data release um, and benchmarks, and we've seen a lot of them today. And so that's that's clearly one way for students to continue to get engaged. Um, and so as, as long as uh, companies like like you folks, if either if you continue, if we convince you to kind of engage. With Well, someone came up to me after my talk telling me that they had a data set 10 times larger than mine. So presumably if they send it to me, then I'll, I'll need to figure out how to train a model that's 10 to 100 times larger. Um, I mean, I, I think the real answer is I don't know, but um, I, I also kind of suspect that, you know, we, we have conversations like this year after year in terms of parameter size and compute and so on, and yet things somehow work out. It's, o it's always difficult, it's always annoying, and yet somehow, you know, these days, uh, someone wouldn't bat an eye about training a model the size of AlexNet, but in 2012, this is, people were like panicking, like, oh, how do, how do I train big convents? It's like, it's hard, it's not, it, it's not trivial, but people manage, so you can't actually make progress. What you can make progress on, if you don't have the resources, is competing entirely on scale, if that's the only thing you're competing on. Uh, if you have resources, then you can, but if you don't, then, then that's, pick some other axis, but I don't think it's that bad, actually. Uh, I agree that there's so, so many gains to be made with algorithmic advances. Um, I, I, I think the interesting thing we're seeing, though, is that even at small scales, you can predict the performance at really high scale. But the question is, how do you increase the gradient of that scaling curve? And I think there's um, tons of opportunity there. Uh, I think you know, ourselves and many others are very open to collaborations, whether it's around data, experimentation, or, or these kind of things. And I, I think partnering is a great way to get access to some of the resources that we have in industry. Um, and then the final thing I'll say is, uh, actually, um, there's a lot to be gained from working with 
released large scale uh, models. You know, the results we showed today uh, for the first time bringing in large language modeling capabilities into a, a driving AI. You know, we didn't train an LLM for scratch. You know, they, they cost millions of dollars to, to, to train. And actually, um, a lot of these results, results were enabled by taking uh, open source LLMs like Llama and, and uh, uh, you know, fine tuning or generalizing them into, into autonomous driving data. Um, I think there's tons, tons of opportunity there. Yeah, may I clarify the question? Was the question uh, about end-to-end -end or AV in general? Uh, it's about AV in general. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, otherwise I would have said just, yeah, give up end-to-end, -end, no chance. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, so regarding AV, I think um, I think orthogonal to, to other panelists' answers, I think there are, are actually areas that as a company is very difficult to work on. So one example is collaboration, right? Think about, you know, when you have a lot of self-driving cars from multiple companies, how can you develop something where, you know, these, these cars, I mean, this will be the future, that these cars will collaborate with each other. So to make everybody safer and to, to actually also accelerate uh, the, 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 you know, the time to arrival for each car. So I think, uh, you know, I have other ideas, but probably not uh, easy to publicly share, but, Ultimately, there are indeed areas that, as a company, is very difficult to uh, venture into. And as an academic, especially as a university uh, academic, that's um, you know those are unique uh, opportunities. Great. Now we have time for two questions from our audience. Who want to take questions? I'm a little bit far away. Could come here? Thank you. Hey guys, uh, thanks so much for the sharing. Um, I'm just curious, um, what would be one thing that you really believe in the field of autonomous driving that you think most of your peers will disagree with you? Yeah, something controversial, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Well, I, I don't know about this crowd, but I, I would guess that actually most folks would disagree with my answer regarding the safety thing, which is that um, I think it's actually entirely possible that the way that we're going to address safety critical systems is by completely not worrying about the problem and just building better, more performant systems. Um, I don't, I wouldn't like kind of go to bat, uh, bat on that being like 100% certain, but I think it's entirely possible that um, in the long run, the way that we'll get uh, safety to work out really well, especially for edge cases, is just by having systems that are trained on enough data that uh, you know, essentially the long tail is uh, sufficiently well represented. I think it's a very distinct possibility. And I see some people uh, like very visibly disagreeing with me in the audience, which means that I answered the question correctly. I'm almost done. Yeah. I don't know, I'm still thinking, I can't think of anything. Yeah, we can move on. And uh, any <laughs> any other questions? Oh, come on. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I guess um, if I claim um, that Cruise is the best autonomous driving company there, yes, I guess uh, <laughs> your Alex would uh, disagree with me. Um, but but I think in in seriousness, right? I I'd say um, that you know this incremental approach. Uh, that we, you know, uh, several uh, larger companies have been uh, approaching the problem. I think this is a right call to kind of scale from a very small one and learn from and iterate to uh, through the expansions. And I think, uh, yeah, overall, this has been working very well for us. Hopefully, that's the right answer. Alex, yeah. <laughs> sure. I, I mean, this, this the strange thing for for me and for us at Wave is that for the last six years, um, you know, almost everything we've been doing is is being quite contrarian in the industry. Uh, I think the feedback we've been getting in the last year is that I think that's becoming less true, as uh, you know, more people are looking at end to end learning methods for driving. And look, we've had a whole discussion on this today. Um, I think some of the things that I, I've I've observed that could be interesting to call out. You know, I think there was this big race. Uh, in the late 2010s that if you solve perception you solve driving and i think the as an industry we learned the hard way that perfect perception does not equal perfect driving um 
I, I actually share that I think safety is all about performance. And I think the idea that you can put a really transparent system around it to, to validate safety is, uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, you build trust by setting and meeting expectations and that comes with performance. Um, and then, you know, thinking that NLP in the language field would actually uh, be able to advance autonomous driving is something that I would have laughed at two years ago. Uh, and now I, I have deep conviction that multimodality and foundation models are going to be enormous here. So I think those are some of the um, some interesting contrarian things I could call out. Go on, you got to give it a throw something in the mix. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. Um, I mean, I, I guess it, this is not really contrarian, but maybe this is me sort of thinking out loud from um, I re recent exposure of, of being involved in in, uh, in efforts that that weren't successful, which is. It seems like the the question that I would have is, you know, at what point does the technology become I don't know, scalable or good enough to actually turn a profit? Versus, which is a different question than, you know, what, at what point is it solved? You know, there are deployments already, um, but clearly the the inflection point that everyone's waiting for. Um, I guess the million dollar question we're always asked is, you know, is, is when when is this going to happen? And of course, there's been you know a history of like um, sort of. Uh, sort of over promising and under delivering so so something I always wrestle with myself is is um you know what is it going to take what kind of investment in time uh is going to take to, to sort of see this all the way through um and so I guess we're all here because we're we're all optimistic and I would say I'm optimistic as well um but um I, I don't know maybe that's not I'm, I'm kind of curious if if, uh, if if the general public views it that way because um, I, I get the sense that there's a bit of fatigue um, uh, in in the promise of self-driving. So, uh, so in some sense, maybe we're we're being contrained by being here. Um, so that's my sneaky way of answering. One more question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, if you had to bet, which approach would get us to uh, AGI point like zero point one? Uh, autonomous vehicles or large language models, which approach would get, get us to generalized intelligence first? Uh, so I, I firmly believe that to build a, well, there's a debate on, uh, the first part of this debate is how do we define um, AGI? But if we take what we might all, I assume we might all assume for, for that, I think, um, to build a system that has that level of intelligence, I think you have to have a world model, you have to have a predictive model inside it that can really um, understand and, and predict the implications of actions, um, likely explicitly, but maybe you could do it implicitly. Uh, and I, I, I think it depends on the motivation of, of, of what you're building. If you're building an LLM for a chat application, um, that may not be necessary and self-driving, um, building a world model is fundamental to solving the problem. And so there's quite a, um, I, I think one argument I'd put forward is there's a really strong incentive to, to build that. Um, I suspect, though, the answer is that uh, we will build the most intelligent system by putting the, as much data and experience as we can around it. And as so the answer is, it's going to be both. It's going to be bringing together a multimodal model across both applications that has the um, really high signal to noise ratio of text uh, that I talked about today, uh, plus the physical interaction and dynamic nature of robotics. Uh, and I think they both bring complementary skills. You know, you can look at experiments of, um, uh, you know, people or animals that are born or grow up paralyzed and don't get to interact with the world and how that really stunts learning uh, or, or, you know, vice versa with interacting with text. And I think both play a really important role in the development of, of an intelligent machine. If that's allowed both is my answer. Um, I, I'm, I, Pretty strongly believe that we need to have um, embodied learning systems if, if they are to acquire the ability to interact with the real world in uh, ways that are as flexible and sophisticated as uh, humans and animals. Um, and I think that there's actually something about um, language models that slightly puts the cart before the horse, uh, but kind of tricks us into thinking that they're actually a lot smarter than, than they really are. So um, it kind of comes back to like very basic um, uh, information theory. Like if you communicate information to somebody, that's what language is for, right? Language is communicating information. It's, it's only worthwhile to communicate stuff that the other person doesn't already know. 
right? Like if you, the most efficient communication channel, you're aware of somebody's prior, and you just communicate those bits that they, don't, they can't already get from their prior. And that means that we're generally not going to be communicating things that everybody is good at. Like you rarely go and tell somebody, hey, here's how I move my muscles uh, to get out of bed in the morning. Like, no, that's not very interesting because everyone, most everyone can do that, right? Um, and those that can't, it's not because they don't know how, it's because of the, the physical limitations, right? So language models kind of trick us a little bit because they're entirely all about language and language is the modality we use to communicate things that we don't already know which means that they're going to sound like they know things that we don't already know. Whereas if you have a, a robot that performs some physical tasks, that's actually very difficult, but that each of us can do easily, it doesn't look so smart. So I think for that reason, actually, there's perhaps a lot more intelligence wrapped up in embodied systems, biological embodied systems, that is, even ones that don't have language, like animals, uh, than we might um, intuitively kind of uh, appreciate. So I think there's actually a lot more depth uh, to intelligence, and a lot of that will come out of embodied systems. All right, that wrap up today's panel discussion. Thank you so much for the insightful discussions and thank you for the amazing talks. Also, thank you for the audience to participate. Really appreciate that. All right, let's wrap up today's you know workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I um, <laughs> 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 <laughs>